I want to greet you, saints, in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are so grateful to God for the gift of life and the opportunity to encourage each other through the word and through music. The program we are in today reminds me of a very nice uh, program done by uh, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir called Music and the Spoken Word, where the choir and the preacher come together to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. And I am convinced that this is the purpose of what this program also is about, with a very aptly named theme, Comfort Ye, My People. For our verse of encouragement, we are in Mark chapter 4, reading from verse 35 to verse 41 of Mark chapter 4. And it says, On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat, as he was and other little boats were also with him and a great wind storm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling but he was in the stern asleep on a pillow and they awoke him and said to him teacher do you not care that we are perishing then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word, which comes to us through the Holy Scriptures and through the lyrics of many men and women whom you inspired to pen their faith. We pray now that from their experiences, when we have sung and we have read, May we also be translated into an experience with you. This we pray through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The verses we have read come from the gospel according to Mark. Depending on any of the material that you may read, you may come across different ideas that are held about the author Mark himself. We have traditional scholarship views and we also have liberal views. What matters, of course, is that when we study the book itself, it certainly presents a very unique pattern that is seen in every chapter of every story, and that is the issue of urgency. In the book of Mark, there is urgency. Things are moving very fast and very quickly. When we study biblical books, we look at the language, we look at the words, we look at the history, the archaeology. We try and collect as much information as we can to help us understand the first context of the word and then be able to apply the current context of the word. And so when we look at the book of Mark, one of the things that we do when we read the language, we see some things that make the book of Mark very unique. For starters, in the book of Mark, there are very few breaks between the stories. You see, Mark overlaps stories in his gospel. He tells a new story having not finished the old story. And this tells us that he is rushing. He is going somewhere. He is rushing us to a particular point. 
We can see in the way that he lays out the stories. For example, we see him telling us about Jesus who has just come out of the boat. But before we know what is happening, two demoniacs are arriving. While Jesus is addressing the demoniacs, Jairus is arriving. While Jesus is addressing Jairus, the woman with the issue of blood arrives. While Jesus responds to the woman, he is also told that the daughter of Jairus is dead. Things are rushing in the gospel of Mark. Stories are told on top of each other because the author has a very important message to send. And that is why you will also see that the gospel of Mark is the shortest of the gospels. It is known as the gospel of action because the writer is interested in revealing Jesus in a particular way. And the message the writer is sending is this. There has come a savior in the world who is urgently addressing our issues. He is solving your issues while addressing my issues, while addressing her issues, while addressing their issues. The point of the gospel of Mark is that we are not in a queue. We don't have to wait till Jesus gets to me. He is addressing all of us at the same time. That is why all cases overlap in the book of Mark to show that in Jesus, no one is in a waiting room. Every case is before God. Every case is being attended. Every case is being answered. Now it may happen that like the demoniac, you may experience your deliverance first before the daughter of Jairus that does not mean that your matter was not before God. That is the message that Mark is sending. But of course, Mark is taking us to the cross where he believes all of God's interventions in our lives will ultimate, ultimately culminate at the cross. At the cross, he will produce a solution that will be the sum of every other solution that God has ever given into our life's problems. But before this gospel of action, gospels even any further, it begins with what one might call an antithesis, an opposite of the rest of the story. Because it begins with Jesus sleeping, which is the opposite of what the rest of the gospel is saying about him. The first story here that we meet that is quite profound, it seems to, 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 to disagree with everything else. The Jesus who gets off the boat is the Jesus of urgency. But the Jesus of the storm is a sleeper. And so something doesn't make sense. Because when you read the story of Jesus and the storm, and then you read how from there onwards he addresses everyone at the same time, everywhere, you find yourself asking, so what could have happened in Mark chapter 4? The Bible tells us that Jesus was exhausted. He had been doing quite a lot throughout the day from other, like John, we know that he had been healing the dead, he, uh, the sick, he had been raising the dead, he had been feeding the sick. And at the end of the day when he was tired, having dispersed the crowds, he went into the boat and there's a key line there. The Bible says, and they took him as he was. As he was, he is exhausted. And they take him with them into the boat. That is the first thing that I want us to understand about the situation we are in. The Bible says they took him as he was. Please pay attention to that because it is what he is. That is the answer to what is happening in the story. He gets in. He immediately goes into the stern and he sleeps. Then the Bible says while they were crossing the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a lake. One of the world's largest lakes. But it is called a sea. Precisely because of how big it is. But also because of the geography. Um, 
it, it, it's got a bit of a, a, a problem. The Sea of Galilee lies, I think, 690 meters below sea level, while Jerusalem sits 1,090 meters above sea level. And so what happens is that the Sea of Galilee, because of the air coming from the Mediterranean, crossing and then cascading down, it creates its own storms. So it behaves like the sea. It has waves and it can be destructive. They were crossing the sea when a storm began. Almost everyone in this boat was a fisherman. They grew up around the towns of Galilee. They were experienced swimmers. You know, when you grow up in villages, for example, people who grew up in villages tend to not need swimming lessons because that is what you do in the rivers and the lakes around. And people who grow up in the coast, it's the same. They, they, they just learn how to swim as part of the community. The disciples had swam the Sea of Galilee quite a number of times before, and they had not drowned. May I also suggest to you that in their careers as fishermen, they had been caught in storms before, but they survived them. The Bible says when this storm began, they did what their history trained them to do. They tried to get the water off the boat. Then the Bible says, realizing that the storm was too much and that they could not deal with the waves that were buffeting the boat, they then sought for Jesus. The first point I want us to understand this evening is one needs to sometimes be able to discern the gift of discernment. Do you know the difference between a normal storm and a spiritual storm? It is possible that you have survived some storms before and another one comes it looks natural, but it is not. It looks natural, but it is not. And many of us, we have no spiritual discernment. We use natural tools to solve spiritual problems. The storm is not asking, are you educated? Sometimes the storm doesn't want to know how much money you have. The storm doesn't want to know, is your medical aid up to date? We tend to respond with the buckets on a storm that needs a God to intervene. Because perhaps in the past, we've been through a storm and God allowed the tools at our disposal to solve the problem. And that now has made us think, every storm I can solve through my money, every storm I can solve through my education, every storm I can solve through my physical strength, every storm I can solve through my connections. Yes, there are problems that God will allow to play out in the domain of humanity, but there are problems that do not require anything from our side. And it takes a life of prayer, a life of faith and discernment to be able to say, Lord, on this matter, I may be educated enough, I may be rich enough, I may be connected enough, but this one I cannot bear, not with any of the tools that you've given me. This is not a situation where I need to buy bread I have money for bread. It is not the solution to this issue. I need you to do something that is beyond the tools that you've made available to me. We can lie in hospitals, even with the best medical aids, even with the best specialists around. But sometimes you need to say to God, this one has nothing to do with the training and experience of my doctors. It has nothing to do with the classification of the hospital I'm in. I need you to come through. This is beyond 
what they are training and my finances are able to pay for. I need you, God, to step in. And so they started with their buckets. But also they start with their buckets because we all have trauma. That's another challenge that we have. Our faith is marred with trauma. A lot of us have suffered before. A lot of us have drowned before. And when we see a storm coming, it is natural to not want to drown again. And so what we do most of the time, we consult ourselves before we consult God. Because we've drowned before. We don't want to relive that experience. And so it naturally kicks in that we should defend ourselves. They tried it. It didn't work. Then they went to look for him and he was sleeping. He was sleeping and there was a storm. And so they asked him an apt question. Do you not care that we are perishing? My brothers and sisters, in this short encouragement, there are two things that emerge that I just want to share. And then we continue to be encouraged in prayer and in music. When he woke up and he quieted the storm, he was the same Jesus who had been sleeping. And the same Jesus whom they brought into the boat. That is why I said that line is important. They brought him into the boat as he is. May I suggest something very important for our faith? That God is as he is. Our challenges are not going to reform him. Our panic will not recreate him. He is God as he is. He is God as he is. Though he may appear weak at times, he is God as he is. Though in the midst of our circumstances, we may wish we had a stronger, better God, I still maintain he is God as he is. And nothing will change that he is God as he is. How is he? Well, let me tell you what happened. When he entered the boat, he was tired. When he entered the boat, he was exhausted. And so you may be saying to yourself, what good is a weak God? Well, then I'll take you to Calvary. And I will say to you, do you know that at the cross, we were saved by a weak, suffering God. Because the God who hangs at Calvary was a wounded, bruised, shaken God. And if at his weakness he was able to save the world, then I still take him weak as he is. If that is what he achieves while he is weak, then I am confident that in his weakness, I choose him more than the, all the strength found in the universe. At the cross, one of my favorite theologians, the late Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he says, we were saved by the suffering God. At the cross, we do not see a glorified God. At the cross, we see a crying God, a pathetic God, a beaten God, a bleeding God, a dying God, and gods don't die. But look at what he achieved on Sunday morning. So I would suggest to you this evening, be careful of judging God just because he looks weak. The man has a tendency to win just when he looks like a loser. The man has an ability to accomplish the impossible just when the situation says he has nothing more to give. At this time, he was asleep. When he got up, 
he comes to the bow of the ship and he says to the storm, peace be still. The tired men, the weak men, the men they brought to the boat as he is, he gets up and he says, peace be still. So I'm going to say it to you again. I am quite happy with Jesus as he is. Because even in his weakness, even in his seeming weakness, what he gets to achieve is what none of us have ever achieved in our fullest strength. In one part of the Old Testament, God says, even if I was a fool, I would still be infinitely wiser than mankind. Be careful of thinking that God plays the game of strength like we are playing the game of strength. You see, as we are going through COVID-19, we are in a very difficult state in the world right now. We are struggling. And this is the second and last thing I want to share with you. No matter how difficult the state we are in right now, please do not make the mistake of thinking that what is happening right now speaks for what God is capable of. When Jesus gets up, he does something that I do not expect. The Bible says he rebuked the storm and said, peace be still. Then he said to his disciples, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? The words don't make sense. The words are mixed. He rebuked the storm and said, peace be still. That's not a rebuke. Rebuke is saying, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? If you follow the language, it doesn't add up. It should say, then he said to the storm, peace be still. Because those are calm words. And then say, and he rebuked the disciples and said, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Instead, the words are plotted differently. The Bible says he rebuked the storm. Then he says to the storm, peace be still. And the storm listened. Then he turns to the disciples and says, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? What is the message that we are getting, getting from this? For me, the message is this simple. Nothing has happened on planet Earth up to now that is beyond God's abilities. The problem in the world is not COVID-19 or unemployment or racism or colonialism. None of those things have ever been beyond God. The problem, the greatest storm in the world is there's no faith. That is the storm that God needs to address the most. Because you see, the storm they thought was a storm obeyed in a matter of seconds. It took seconds for nature to listen. How many years has it taken for you and me to listen to God? So then we must ask, who is the real storm? Where is the real storm coming from? The problems of this life obey his voice every day. Every day we pray for the sick, they get healed. Every day we pray for people to get jobs, they get jobs. Our problem in this world is not the storms we are facing. Our problem is the storm brewing inside. There is no faith. We do not trust God. As we begin this beautiful Sabbath, I want to remind you and myself, there is nothing that has happened in my life and in your life that is beyond God's control. 
nothing has happened to warrant us panicking. Nothing has happened that says we are now a godless planet and we need to be rescued. Nothing has happened to suggest that planet Earth is abandoned. Nothing has happened to suggest that you and I must just take a gun, point it on our heads and end our lives. I will say it again. Nothing has happened. Nothing that warrants us to think there is no God. He is still in charge. He looks weak. That doesn't bother me. Read the whole Bible. He specializes in situations that make him look like an underdog. Where do you want to begin? Was he not an underdog when he created the universe from nothing? Where had he seen the world being made? Who had coached him? Who was his motivational speaker that told him he can do it? He's always worked from a point where it seems like he can't. Did he not establish a nation from a single man called Abraham? Did he not take a shepherd and make a king? Why now are we worried? Did he not choose to come as a human being in order to save us? He's never been bothered by looking like he's losing. No situation that has ever made him look weak has actually proven itself to be true. In every situation where he had been counted out, when the sun rose the next day, Victory belonged to Jesus. I am not bothered by the fact that when I pray, sometimes it feels as though God is sleeping. I am not bothered by the fact that sometimes we look weak and the devil's forces look strong. My Bible is my heritage. My life is my own testimony that where God has looked weak, where conclusions have been made that he will fail, he has always excelled. It may feel right now that you are worshipping a sleeping God. He is asleep because you've lost a loved one. He is asleep because you lost your job. He is asleep because your business is not doing well. He is asleep because a marriage you worked hard for has come to an end. He is asleep because someone you love is in a hospital and it seems they are not going to get better. He is asleep because our economies are crumbling. He is asleep because the politicians we elected are now looking at us as if we are scorn. But I have a message for you. Show me one case in his scriptures where his appearance of weakness confirmed he would lose he has never lost he has never lost not even when his weakness demanded that he dies he didn't lose that fight either he will not lose me he will not lose you 
even on the day I die, I will not die because he lost. My story and his victory will be retold at resurrection morning. Do not allow the situations of this world to suggest to you you have no God. He looks weak sometimes. He sleeps. But when he wakes up from his sleep, he quiets storms. He builds faith. Whatever you and I are going through, even when he appears weak, you and I are stronger with him than without him. I am not his spokesperson. I don't need to spin his story. The Bible says he slept. So we cannot deny that he sleeps. But what the Bible also tells us is that even when he is asleep, he's in control. Even when he is asleep, he's in control. I'm safe. You are safe. In him. Nothing has happened that says we are godless. Nothing has happened that says we are hopeless. That is why the Bible then challenges us and says, the just shall live by faith. Because at some point, things will not make sense. Perhaps even God will not make sense. And at a time when we cannot give ourselves the answers, at a time when we cannot explain what he is doing, faith is the only thing that gives us access to peace beyond understanding I pray I pray for you and myself that whatever you are currently going through I pray that the sleeping God the weak crucified Savior may actually show us that things are not always what they seem he is in control. He is in charge. Even when he looks weak, he is in charge. Father, in the name of Jesus, the Bible is littered with evidence of situations where those who believed in you looked finished and undone. From Genesis to Revelation, from our very own lives, we have no shortage of circumstances where it looked like we were overwhelmed and finished. When it looked like this was the end of who we are. We have no shortage of prayers prayed in anger. When it seemed you were sleeping useless and gone. When it seemed we needed somebody else to come through for us. When like the Israelites, we were saying perhaps Egypt was better. Perhaps the things we worshipped before we came to you worked better. Yet like the Bible, the Bible is not the only one with evidence 
of what you did seemingly out of your weakness. How you came through beyond expectation. Indeed, many of us, we are exhibits of that. The life we live today testifies to the fact that we no longer look, sound, act like the losers and underdogs we used to look like. Because even in our own lives, dear Jesus, there is evidence that cannot be refuted. That in your seeming weakness, you did come through. Now, Father, I pray. It may not be my season now. It may be somebody else's season. Somebody else right now believes you are weak. Somebody else right now believes you are sleeping and you do not care. Somebody else right now believes you have abandoned them and have no interest. Father, this one thing I ask of you. Do as you have always done. Show us what you can accomplish. In spite of what the situation says, you cannot. Reveal your power in our individual lives, community lives, national situations, global issues. We need, we need the sleeping God to say, peace be still. So that the world may understand that it is not by our might nor our power, but by your spirit alone. Someone is grieving and they are asking, where were you? Someone does not know whether they have enough for their electricity bill and they are asking, where are you? Someone is in a hospital and they are asking, where are you? Father, I am asking in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, Show the world, show the world of what you can accomplish. Glorify yourself in our lives. Lift your standard as the only true God. Help us to see through faith what we are unable to see through the flesh. Let your power radiate through and establish your authority in our lives. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.